Welcome back everyone to a video about a computing topic that a lot of students, beginning programmers, may not get in class. Of course, all source code for this video is available through Patreon. A big thanks to all of you that support the channel in various ways. If you like what you see here, please consider giving this video a like, subscribe if you wanna make sure you don't miss the next one. And of course, if there's a topic you'd like to see in a future video, be sure to comment down below. For this video, I'm using C, but the topics we're talking about translate really well into just about any programming language, either natively or through some kind of add-on or library. Okay, so computer data is binary. I know this, you know this, my mom and dad who don't write computer software, they know this. But even we as programmers that are dealing with these binary data all the time usually don't interact directly with the ones and zeros. For example, if I declare an int on my machine, that integer is going to be two or four bytes, that's a bunch of ones and zeros, but normally I just treat it like it's a single numeric value. When I assign this int to a new value, it's going to change all 32 bits all at once. But today we're going to do things a little bit different. As we look at bit fields, we're actually going to access individual bits and those bits are going to have meaning. And the main reason for this is usually space. We're either trying to represent data very compactly. Maybe we have a lot of data and we're trying to limit how much memory we're using. Maybe we're sending data over the network and we really want to pack as much information as possible into a few number of bytes because we've got limitations on the packet size that we can send. But either way, when we're trying to pack as much information into a small space as we can, that's where bit fields come in. So a bit field is just a series of bits where individual bits mean different things. And it could be individual bits or clusters of bits, but single bits or chunks of bits are meaning something. And you're going to see bit fields show up in three different scenarios that I'm gonna talk about today. The first is for representing options, flags or attributes that you're passing to a function. Consider the open function, the one we use to open files. So we give it a path to the file we want to open, and then we give it a bunch of flags, and you'll notice the flags argument is just an integer. But when you see examples of how open is used, you're gonna see something like this. And you might be wondering, how does bitwise oring these constants together? You might just be thinking, this is a really strange way to do this, except it's really not. You see, what's going on is that the flags parameter is a bit field. It's an int, so that's 32 bits on my machine, but each of those 32 bits corresponds to one of these different options. Well, that's of course assuming that there are 32 options. It's actually likely that some of them aren't used here. So when I or in the read only option, what that does is that sets the bit that corresponds to the read only flag to one. Okay, so setting that bit to one means I want to open this in read only mode. So let's see how this would work in an example of our own. So say I have a function that logs messages to a file. A lot of software out there uses log files, so servers, you see this a lot. And these log files give you a record of what happened so that you can go back and figure out why stuff broke when things eventually go wrong. So this log message function logs some message that I give it along with a bunch of other information. So it prints out a counter, the date and time of the message and the user's login ID, and of course the message that we want to log to the file. And down here in main, I'm just testing things out. But what if I don't always wanna print out all of this stuff? Maybe I'm making a library with a generic function here and I want to give my users lots of options, but I don't wanna force them to use all of the options all the time. I want to leave that up to them. So let's make another argument to my function that's going to give us some options. And for this, of course, because it's the topic of our video today, we're going to use a bit field. Notice that I'm using a uint8 underscore t, which is just an 8-bit unsigned integer. I have a video on standard ints if you want to check it out. I'll put a link in the description. But this variable gives me 8 bits to work with, and that's going to be enough for me since I don't plan on having more than 8 different options for this function. Now let's define our options. Let's give the users the option to include the time, the date, the user login ID, and the counter. Okay, and I'm going to define each of these values as an 8-bit sequence with a single one and all the rest set to zero, okay? So a one in the first bit, the zeroth bit is going to mean include the time. A zero will mean don't include the time. A one in the next bit position means include the date and so forth. Okay, so now I can come down here and check these bits to see if that option has been selected. For this, I'm going to use the bitwise and operator, which is going to go through each bit position and return a one if both bits in that position are one. So in this case, we will only have a one in that position if it was previously set. And we'll do this with count and the date and the time and the username. And that's it. Now we need to come down into main and add the options to our log function calls. For the first one, let's just not pass in any options. For the second, let's do the username and the date 
For the third, we'll request the time, the username, and the count. And for the last one, we'll just display the count. And now if we open our terminal and compile it and run it, you notice that it works. The log messages are appearing and the options that we requested are being included. The great thing about bit fields here is that it allows us to easily mix multiple options. And this doesn't just have to happen when I call the function. I can also come up here and define some other options that are combinations of the individual options that I have already defined. Like for example, I can make one that turns on all of the options in a single super option. Or maybe I want people to be able to request a pair of options like date and time, which often go hand in hand. So these hybrid combination options are going to work just as if we combined the original options with the bitwise or operator. Just to make sure, let's test it down in main. And sure enough, you can see that it works just how we want it to. And so this used to specify a collection of options or flags. This is scenario number one. And it's one that you're going to see all the time in a bunch of different C APIs and libraries. Scenario number two is when you want numerical values like integers, but you don't want to spend a lot of space on them. Maybe, for example, you're just trying to store a person's grade in school, and you know that it's always going to be a number between 0 and 12, and it seems really wasteful to use 32 bits to store a number that you know won't ever use most of those bits. So just to show you how this works, I'm going to define a struct with three counters in it. The first will use only two bits, and the second uses four, and the third uses six. So otherwise, these counters are identical. They're just different in how many bits they use and how much space they take up. Now let's make a loop that's going to go through and count up each of these counters, and then I'm going to print out the values. And this, I think, will allow you to see this sort of bit field in action. OK, so let's declare our counters. And let's initialize each counter to 0. And then each time through the list, I'm going to increment all three counters, the little, the medium, the large. And then we'll print out the values each time through the loop. That way we can see what's going on. And let's compile it. And it seems that I can't spell little. Now let's try again. Let's compile it and run it. And we get a bunch of numbers. Let's go back up to the top of the output. And you'll notice that the negative numbers here initially might seem a little confusing to some of you. But remember that we are dealing with signed ints. So because it's a signed int, the most significant bit in the binary number determines the sign. So if you keep incrementing any integer, it will eventually become negative. And that's what's happening here. The first one becomes negative really quick because it only has two bits. So it can only store four different values. So now, say we want to stick with non-negative values. We can make these all unsigned, and I'm going to change it up in the struct as well. And now if I compile it and run it, we see the same thing, but they're all positive. So you, you notice that we count up to the largest integer that can be represented with two, four, or six bits, and then it wraps back to zero. Now, the point of all this was to save space, right? So just to make sure that we're actually saving space, I'm also going to go and print out the size of the struct just to make sure that we're actually saving space. With two, four, and six bits, that's 12 bits total, I should only need about two bytes to represent that, right? And if I compile it, oops, size of returns an unsigned long, OK, now we can compile it and run it. And it's using four bytes, which is a bit frustrating. If my goal was to cram as much information into the smallest space possible, I was not successful. So, so why? Why did this happen? Well, the reason is the compiler thinks the program will run faster if it aligns the members of my struct along certain boundaries. 
And you know it's probably right. If all you care about is speed, just let the compiler do its thing. Let the compiler lay things out in memory the way that it wants to. But what if I do really want to cram all these values into two bytes? What if I do really want to save space even if it means that my code runs slightly more slowly? Because I want to use less memory. Well, in that case, I can just tell the compiler to pack the struct like this. Here we're basically just saying to the compiler, when you lay this one out in memory, pack it all together. Keep everything very tight, right, one after the other. And now if you compile it and run it, you'll notice that it is only taking up two bytes. So that's scenario number two. The third bit field scenario I want to talk about is when you want your bit field to act like an array of bits. You don't have a name for each bit position. You just want to treat this 64-bit unsigned integer as an array of 64 bits. Okay, it's an array of ones and zeros. Now, it would be awesome if we could just do something like this and declare an array of bits. Trust me, many a programmer has dreamed this dream, but I'm sorry, the language isn't going to do this for us today. So instead, I'm going to define a few macros. One is to set a bit to one. I'm writing out all the bytes in hex here just to remind you that there are eight of them, but I basically just shift a one to the left n places and then or that with the bit field. Second, I want to have a macro that will clear a bit back to zero. We do this by shifting a one left end positions in the same way we did before, but this time we take the complement, basically turning the ones to zeros and the zeros to one, and then we and that with the bit field. And that will leave all the other positions alone and just turn the bit we want to a zero. Okay, finally, let's make a macro that will test and see if a particular bit was set. For this, I'm going to shift the bit field right end positions and and it with one. That's going to remove everything except for the position that we are interested in. And that will remove everything except the position that we are interested in. And so it'll be a one if it's set, it'll be a zero if it's cleared. So let's try it out. Let's set a few bits. Let's uh, clear a bit as well, just to make sure that's working. Now let's go through our array and use our isBitSet macro to determine whether or not each bit is set. And we'll print out a plus sign if it's set and a period if it's not. And of course we need a new line at the end. And now let's go to our terminal. We'll compile it and run it, and you can see that the bits we set are set, and the one we cleared is not set. And if I change the pattern, set another bit and compile and run, you notice that the pattern is updated appropriately. So that's it for today. I hope this helps you better understand bit fields to know what they are and how you can use them in a variety of scenarios. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you don't want to miss the next video, and until then, I'll see you later.